My name is Liz Langdon Gray. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. Before we start, a few housekeeping reminders. The talk today is being both webcast live and recorded for posterity and available after the talk on the Berkman Klein Center website and also on the Harvard Data Science Initiative website. If you are so inclined, you can tweet at us at, at BKC Harvard and at Harvard underscore data. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to today's talk and a distinct privilege for me to introduce our speaker, Christine Borgman. Professor Borgman is the Distinguished Professor and Presidential Chair in Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is a fellow of both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Association for Computing Machinery, and she is the Harvard Data Science Initiative's very first visiting faculty fellow. We are thrilled to have her here for the month of October. Professor Borgman is also the author of three books published by the MIT Press. Her most recent book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, Scholarship in the Next Networked World, is available here today. We have a representative from the Harvard Coop, and the book is $25. She has graciously agreed to sign copies after the talk. I can think of no better speaker to deliver the first joint talk before the Ber be hosted between the Berkman Klein Center and the Harvard Data Science Initiative. Researchers at Harvard and across academia are embracing the opportunities afforded by the convergence of new technologies and the availability of vast amounts of data. These data may come from sources as diverse as electronic medical records, financial transactions, and billions on billions of social media posts every day. They may also come from universities themselves, from the research data produced in our labs and libraries, and from the administrative data that accumulates from the very day-to-day -day running of a university. Researchers are developing the theory, algorithms, and systems that will allow us to draw meaning from these data. And they are using data to shed new light on old questions and to tackle new questions that are demand our attention. Importantly, these efforts are underpinned by a commitment to pioneering the ethical use of data, from devising new ways to promote, promote algorithmic fairness to maintaining individuals' privacy. This commitment is reflected in the missions of both the Harvard Data Science Initiative and the Berkman Klein Center. As organizations, we are partnering to advance analysis and interpretation of data and the deployment of that analysis for the social good. And I'm gonna read the next part because it's got lots of names in it. Professor Borgman's talk today is a timely exploration of the challenges that we are facing. The talk is based on a new article in the Berkeley Law and Technology Journal and draws from work presented at the 10th Annual Berkeley Law Privacy Lecture hosted by the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology in November of 2017. Respondents at that lecture were Professor Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law, and Professor Katie Shilton of the University of Maryland. Following Borgman, Professor Borgman's talks, there will be ample opportunity for questions. I'll ask that you hold your questions until then. And with that, I'd like to yield the podium to Professor Borgman. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And it's wonderful to be here and are, are we on, Ellen? Uh, no? We were. We were on a second ago. Okay. Are we on now? How's that? Good. All right. Anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be working with both Berkman and with the Data Science Initiative. And as you will note, my first affiliation is the Center for Astrophysics as well. So I span many fields. I've been working on building information systems and studying information systems for most of my career. And the privacy interests have been a sideline uh, for much of that career. In the last five years or so, they've really converged. They converged in that big lecture last year and a course on privacy and information technology. I taught at UCLA and now in this paper, which came out last week, even though the, the digital object identifier does not yet resolve, but it is there up on the website. So that's our first little tech joy. Uh, I'm gonna take a very high level, broad sweep over a number of issues and assume that this audience is pretty familiar with fundamental concepts of privacy and information technology and policy issues. Uh, and we can go back to some if I'm a little too high level.
as we go, because this is really a changing nature of the world pretty quickly. Um, universities have moved into a really data-rich world. Universities are collecting data at far faster rates than most faculty or most administrators have any idea. There's very rich data, they're assets, they're valuable, uh, but they are valuable not only to the universities themselves, many third parties see value in these data. And the brokering with third parties is also what's complicating a lot of the issues that universities face. So we collect them for research and teaching, for services, but at the same time, we need to be very aware of the public trust that is uh, a responsibility of universities. And I'm gonna talk about the privacy, the academic freedom, and some of the stewardship and governance issues that are involved. Okay. So what does this privacy frontier uh, look like? The Move toward open data is much of what has really launched us into the opportunities and the challenges that we're facing uh, today. Now, those of us who do empirical research, uh, which is to say most people in law schools are not in the business of getting grants, but those of us who need grants to collect data live and breathe by this set of rules and policies. Um, how many of you are familiar with these open data policies? Okay, so, few, so fewer than a fewer than, fewer than half, which sort of tells me what the, the range of the audience is. These policies have been evolving for 15 to 20 years. And what's uh, the current state of things in most countries is that when you apply for a grant from a public funding agency, increasingly from private funding agencies as well, you have to submit a data management plan that says how you're going to make your research data available, how you're going to manage them, and uh, how you're going to use them for the long term. And you're also stating some responsibility at the end of, at the, end of the grant and even at the end of ir every publication, you're expected to release the data sets that go with those publications. So this is sort of the current data practice in science, social sciences, and parts of the humanities as well. Anyone who really does, does grant funding. In, uh, in the book, which came out in 2015, I analyze a number of these policy documents or what are the drivers behind these policies. And this is generally what I found. The reproducing research comes up very highly, and that, that's a controversial topic, but the idea is the gold standard of science is to make data transparent, available, uh, show your work in a way that other people can test it and reuse it and see if, see if you're right and look for new findings. The second is one that you also hear quite often, which is if taxpayer money is going into the grant, the, the public should have access to the products of the grant. Uh, thirdly, you want to leverage investments, and then more generally, advancing research and innovation. Okay, and the, the European policy really pushes on that last point quite a bit. Okay. We've also got uh, changes in the way people do their research, you know, depositing, and you can deposit in many places, uh, starting with Dataverse, which Mirce runs right here. Uh, you can put it in the National Institutes of Health databases if it's biomedical. You can put it in Dryad if it's ecological. There's many places that are domain specific to put data if it's more generic data, if it doesn't have a home, there's loads of orphan data out there. Uh, those data can go in places like Dataverse or universities or university institution repositories. You're expected to provide enough documentation, often including software and code books and code, with the data so that other people can retrieve them, reuse them, and interpret them in the long, in the long term. We have this set of uh, practices and uh, policies, principles. Uh, Mary says among the et al there, she can talk about fair principles for the rest of the day or year probably about what's involved. But the idea is you want to release your data in ways that they're findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The rub is that very few of any of these policies actually define data. And I spent an entire chapter of the book on just the question of what are data. You can get into epistemological and phenomenological discussions very, very quickly when you ask people what are your data and start to see what is actually subject to these regulations. 
Do you have to save the specimens? Do you have to save uh, the spreadsheets? Do you only have to report what's in the journal article? Mm -hmm. How much of the software do you need to release? Do you need to release what's at the end of the pipeline? Do you need to release the entire astronomy pipeline and so on? Many different levels of what can be data that vary and we see all over the different parts of our studies because we're working with astronomy, earth sciences, seism seismology, ecology, uh, undersea oceanography and so on that one person's signal is somebody else's noise. So what our data is one of the most challenging parts of what applies. Also what's changing is just the nature of what scholarly publication looks like and the way in which we disseminate our knowledge. We have recently celebrated the 350th anniversary of the first English language journal, the uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which is still publishing after 350 years. These are what are known as formal publications in sort of in library talk. Uh, they last a long, libraries keep them, they're cataloged, they're indexable. These are the ones that are findable and accessible, whether or not they're interoperable or reusable, maybe another matter. Now, librarians also think in terms of gray literature, and this is where the gray data in the title uh, comes from, thinking about these things. On the left is a whole taxonomy or typology of some of the different kinds of gray literature. These are documents of various forms, they, they might be videos, they might be whatever, that may be the only documentation of the evidence on something. They don't show up in library catalogs, they might be in file folders, they might be indexed, they might be on microfilm. Uh, these are hard to capture, but, they've been, but people try to capture them. And notice that data sets is, is one of the things that's been considered great literature for all these years. Now these are getting picked up in uh, Figshare and Slideshare and Zenodo and YouTube and call all kinds of other places. So this sort of gray data is a growing and messy category that uh, is much of which is not findable or accessible, much less interoperable or reusable. Okay. So that takes us to what I'm calling gray data as an analogy to the gray literature. And this is the idea that we are just generating massive kinds of data, sometimes called data exhaust, that comes off these systems. And a great deal of it just falls between the cracks. It's not governed by any of the data protection policies that are the usual way that you think about privacy. Uh, FERPA has a giant loophole, which is universities can pretty much determine what legitimate educational use means. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, if things don't get covered by IRB, if they're not human subjects, then you know, people go and say, is this human subjects? I'm putting cameras in the hallway of the engineering building because I'm testing some new vision algorithms. Is that human subjects research? If the IRB says no, a lot of people say, fine, then I can do whatever I want to with it. University of California is very concerned about protecting these data, really leaning toward the privacy and governance side, but in a whole lot of universities, this is the Wild West. If it doesn't fall under specific rules, you can pretty much do whatever you want with it, and that's opening us up to all kinds of interesting challenges today. The publications, the gray data, the research data, all then become different kinds of networks. They're, they're much more useful when you can start to combine them, model them, merge them, aggregate them, integrate them. The value is not so much in the individual data point, it's in the power of bringing these things together. So this is also where we are of these, these new models. Now, universities have many responsibilities of using these data and managing them, and I'm gonna walk us through privacy, the academic intellectual freedom, and the stewardship and governance, and then I'm gonna take us through some of the uses and misuses of these data that we're facing. Okay. This one uh, comes from, the, a UCLP is the University of California Office of the President. Several of you have had some affiliation with UC here. Uh, I was one of the, fa the three faculty on uh, this four-year project, uh, which brought together uh, the, the provost, the chief legal counsel, uh, 
other people at the very top dealing with some of the governance and the uh, institutional responsibility of, you know, how do you think about privacy and information security together at something as massive as the entire University of California, something at scale? And this is where we ended up, and it turned out to be very useful as far as laying out the governance models. The law makes a distinction between informational privacy and autonomy privacy. And we made that distinction, not exactly along the legal lines, but the rough one. Whereas people, what most people were thinking of at the surface was a narrow definition of privacy, which is the things, of, you know, your student ID, keeping that kind of stuff confidential, the things that would call, fall under HIPAA or PII, as opposed to thinking about autonomy privacy, which is very important to us in the university, is can you do your research without being observed? Can you conduct your classroom? Is the classroom a safe space to have difficult conversations about hard topics that you don't really want broadcast? You know, can you think about you know, the kinds of rules of governance about this is a safe space that's not gonna get tweeted, we can have hard discussions and have them, uh, have them close and facing inwards. So that, that's where the autonomy comes in. And then the information security needs to protect all of this. Okay, so these distinctions are very important in thinking about data governance and what, what we need to accomplish here. So information privacy is this narrow one. We need to protect these you know, obvious PII, personal identifiable information, about people, keep them confidential. Uh, but at the same time, we've got um, autonomy, privacy. You know, can we protect this space? And can we protect people's research in progress? Okay. So the fact that uh, the, one of the groups that we're working with at UCLA has been able to conduct their research and reanalyze their data for almost 25 years now, they were not required to release these data with every single paper. They have been continually reanalyzing, getting new data, bring them together completely legitimately, and they did not have to work completely in the open. It's very different to say, you can see everything I'm doing while I'm doing it, as opposed to saying, no data before it's time. You know, make it available at the end of the publication process. So we would like to have, to be able to do these things without surveillance, and that's where the academic freedom comes in uh, to the autonomy privacy. Okay, so privacy is a messy concept. Many books have been written, books by Solov, Nissenbaum, uh, Chemerinsky has some very good articles on that, just trying to define what our pri you know, what, what does privacy mean in the first place? So we won't try to pin that down too much. Uh, similarly, academic freedom is a large and messy concept, but this is a nice one from um, Donald Kennedy, who was president of Stanford when, when I was a, a graduate student there, which is that it says, you know, we need the freedom to do the kind of research that we feel is important for society, but we also have a responsibility to publish those results and make them, make them available. So that's that two sides of a coin, which gets us to the, the stewardship and governance issues. So we want to protect privacy, both the information privacy and the autonomy privacy. We want to be concerned about um, academic freedom, keep our infrastructure secure, manage our data, data in fair ways, and then governance uh, principles and processes. Now, how many things are in the job description of your average data scientist or a statistician? Okay. This is way broader than any one, you know, any one job description exists. And most of these things are not readily covered in any job description and that they don't fall under any one dean or any one vice chancellor or vice president either. They're very scattered. The uses of data are highly decentralized and the governance is highly decentralized if people are even thinking about bringing them together. So that's what gets us to the, the privacy frontier of these uses and misuses. I'll talk about pub public records requests, how that fits in, uh, some of the cyber risk and data, re data breach issues that universities are facing, and then come back to, uh, come back to data management and, uh, and infrastructure. Okay. So 
Reuse is what we have been studying in good depth a number of different disciplines in recent years. And to us, that's, that's sort of the highest calling is, can you produce data and make them truly interoperable and reusable in ways that you can get new findings? That, I mean, that, that should be the long term where we want to go. And reproducibility would be a subset of that. But it's a contentious one, and one person's reproducibility is somebody else's epistemological disagreement. You know, people are just coming from very different places, different models, different ways of thinking about a problem. So in some areas, notice this was a, a survey done by Nature. Half the people surveyed said, yes, there's a real reproducibility crisis. Others say no. Depends on the field, depends on how you ask the question. But it's, again, a messy problem. So how do we respond to this? How many of you have ever had somebody attempt to reproduce your research? And how, so then the question is how one feels about that. It's supposed to be the, you know, the gold, st gold standard of science. Uh, this particular faculty member responded with a lawsuit. Okay. It's a very famous lawsuit from, from about a year ago. So here the question is, you know, how dare you, you know, try to reproduce and then publish this critique, sued for $10 million, which has really you know, brought a lot of these things that tend to be sort of sub rosa within the universities up into, into the public sphere and view. This is another one, cover of the New York Times Magazine from last year. Now this is partly a Harvard case. I know what was public. Many of you may know some of the backstory of this. But the attempts at reproducibility are also bringing out trolls in, in not a good way. Okay. And women are more trolled than men. Okay. And so some of what's been written about this is this is a, a trolling case where men using the same methods as she was using did not receive the kind of scrutiny that she did. Now, that's the public story. Many of you will know a backstory. But the point is that these you know, data and attempts at reproducibility can also be weaponized in ways that were not part of those, that larger set of goals around why we want open data. Okay. Um, who owns your data at Harvard? Do you own your data? Do the overseers own the data? Does the Harvard board own the fair? The University, the University of California uh, claims ownership. It would never be said that it is owned, nobody wants to it. Right, and, so the, and that's why we're tending to use the governance. OK, uh, and let, let me hold the comments to the end, too, if I may. Uh, what she said is nobody would really declare that data are owned. The University of California has claimed ownership, but it goes to a, a 1958 clause about owning laboratory notebooks. Okay. And that's all cited and discussed in the Berkeley Law and Technology paper. The notion of ownership doesn't usually come up until there's a fight. And again, here's a very public fight between the University of California and the University of Southern California when you've got many millions of dollars of research funding at stake, and this also turned out to have National Institutes of Health funding on one <coughs> side and a large pharma company on the other side. So then the question becomes, who owns these data? Who owns this database when a professor moves from one university to another and wants to take the data sets with him or her? This is where the governance issue, this is where the rubber hits the road about ownership, gov governance, uh, fair use, uh, things like uh, non-exclusive licenses and agreements, Creative Commons, all gets fit in. There's many cases like this, I'm so giving you some high level ones. The student data is one of the most contentious and most complicated, and this is where you've either got big concerns of privacy or you've got a wild west and diff a lot of contention within universities. Uh, I chaired this task force, the National Science Foundation. The report came out 10 years ago. And we built privacy into this. You know, we're really taking a very systemic uh, kindergarten through, uh, through graduate school, through lifelong learning, and think about data protection and data collection at the same time. And yet, this is much more the headlines that you see is the future is being able to do data collection at scale and test out educational innovations in different ways. So this is not the way you want to be in the news. Okay. This, again, is a very famous case. 
uh, where instead of uh, having an attendance sheet, uh, turning on the surveillance cam uh, cameras in the classroom, collecting data without students' knowledge, without professors' knowledge, and then counting how many seats there were with, uh, with algorithms. Okay. Uh, nice use of algorithms, but not a privacy protecting, uh, intellectual freedom, acad academic freedom, or information autonomy, privacy autonomy protecting way of going about it. So again, we've got stories in Chronic Wire Head, Chronic Wire Head many other places of, you know, if you really love to collect data, this sounds like a really cool idea, but is this how we want to be you know, collecting data in our classrooms? Do we really want to be putting sensors on our students and seeing how attentive they are and building models about them? Now to the, now to the library view of the world, again, is uh, libraries, are very much based, based on intellectual freedom and academic freedom, at least in the US, it's not true around the world, uh, but this idea of the right to read anonymously is kind of embedded in the, in the whole freedom to read of this part of the American Library Association. And then Julie Cohen famously codified that in a law review journal uh, in 1996. It's actually been, been quite a while now. And then, since that was really fleshed out. Because by that point, we were already seeing the threats to academic freedom of publishers and other parties wanting to track what people are reading. And library catalogs have been specifically built not to track, which is why you don't get recommend, recommendation systems on library catalogs, because there's sort of a, there's a do not track ethic that, that's very much built into them, which is not what's built into the publisher model. Now, universities are also in a very difficult situation just making a contract with some of these publishers. They're taking analytics at a much finer grain than you might want to think. And I, I point you to this very good article from Cliff Lynch, uh, a, again, a year or so ago, of what's happening with that, that trade-off. So, Things that you're reading are being tracked, even in a university environment, more than, more than most of us would like. So improve your recommendations, give us your address book, and so on and so forth. Libraries don't like to do that. Okay. Uh, this is one that I assume is very well known to people in this room, that anonymizing the data is um, not even, not sufficient, it's no longer possible. Okay, this is a, a you know, again, Latanya Sweeney now here at Harvard uh, famously showed in 2000, you know, going on 20 years ago, that 87% of all Americans could be uniquely identified with three bits of information, zip code, birth date, and sex. Okay. And it's gotten way worse now because there's so much data out there, it's very easy to, uh, to re-identify almost anything with data. So we've got to have other ways of governance because this is a high level uh, survey. Now let's turn to public records requests. Universities do a lot with public records requests. This is a famous book where uh, John Wiener of the, uh, UC Irvine spent about 20 years filing FOIA requests to get the FBI files on John Lennon and then this important book came out. So universities want to use these where, where they can use them. FOIA is the federal, there's public records requests at the state level. Now, what happens when people come and start trolling the university to get access to faculty emails and faculty research data? Harvard is a private university, so is MIT. This university is not subject to state level public records requests where UMass is. In Southern California, University of California is subject to them, but the University of Southern California and Caltech are not. So that puts public universities in an even more precarious situation with dealing with some of these requests. Uh, this is a, a well-known one, Michael Mann, the famous ho hockey stick graph of environmental change. Uh, the trolls went after him, the politics went after him, and you know, often the goal here is to, ch you know, to get somebody's data, cherry pick the data, draw different kinds of conclusions, and then uh, push them out in different ways. Many cases like this. The University of California uh, put a task force together and came out with this policy in, in 2012, and it's been adopted by many other universities since, saying, uh, we, you know, here, here's academic freedom, 
but and we you know we are legally uh, required to respond to public records requests, and we do. But here's how we treat them, okay? And here you know here's how we very carefully uh, constrain what is appropriate, what's not as appropriate. So this was published. This gave a lot of guidance to other universities um, to work with. So the the freedom and the access is a, a challenge. But also as a challenge is the data breaches. And I've spent the last three years uh, as vice chair and then chair of the UC-wide Academic Computing and Communications Committee, which put me on the University of California President's Cyber Risk <coughs> Governance Committee. So I spent a lot of time dealing in Oakland, UC-wide, with this set of issues. Uh, University of California, certainly Harvard, MIT, you name the major university, is a target of foreign governments. There's very rich intellectual property here. The bigger, the more the data, the bigger the target. Okay, there's lots of people coming after these universities. This is just the .edu. Uh, I pulled this one yesterday. Uh, 25 million records breached, and these are the ones that made the legal threshold of having to report. So this is probably the tip of the iceberg. Universities are very big targets for, uh, for data breaches. Okay. And uh, protecting the borders is quite the challenge. When I taught the privacy course last year, I gave every student a different major breach to go investigate. See, what can you actually find out about this? Here's two of their favorites. One is the target attack uh, through the heating and air conditioning system, which was so it's, it's a matter of just hitting the weakest link and, and getting in. This, these are not built as secure systems. And even four years ago, they thought at least 55,000 <coughs> systems were internet connected. Okay, so uh, before you put nest in your house or in your building, think about uh, that, that as, as a vector. Uh, this was another favorite one, uh, the baby, you know, the baby cams being one of the major vectors uh, for getting into these. They, these Internet of Things were not built with secure systems in mind, and there's many ways to get in. So data stewardship is this big, big challenge for universities. It's a, it's a challenge for every corporation, every organization. Uh, but particularly universities, because of the way we run, you know, we, we want to be open by design. We want our collaborators, some of whom are in countries that are attacking us for our intellectual property at the same time, and we need to let them into our systems to work together on data, and yet we've got to find out what's, you know, what's a penetration attack and what's truly a collaborative process, and this is messy. We can't just plug the systems into the cloud with an Ethernet cable, nice that might be. This, this you know, diagram in the middle, this is much more what it is. Tying these systems together and migrate them is often really getting a hammer and getting all those pieces together. It's the graduate students and the postdocs who do most of the data collection, write most of the algorithms, do the, the, uh, the data management. They are not security experts, and we should not expect them to be. It's, it's beyond you know, the job description. Uh, it's not that the corporate world is a, you know, a perfect case of data protection, but we have special cases because of the trend toward openness and needing to manage these. So this is, again, what part of I coined in the, the Berkeley paper is we've got this long-running aphorism in privacy and security that you know, if you can't protect it, don't collect it. But universities are already collecting it. So if you collect it, you should take responsibility for it, and we're not thinking enough yet about how we need to take that responsibility. So we've got you know, this open by design, open data. Privacy by design, again, has been around for decades. It's much more honored in the breach in terms of really building into systems, but it's something we need to be thinking about more. Uh, similarly, uh, one of the things I was asked to talk to the Cyber Risk Governance Committee about was uh, how can we get the faculty to stop leaking data? Okay. So now wait a minute, let's talk about who's leaking, whether is it people leaking data, is it a people problem or is it a systems problem? When I go to, to do course grades and I need to get one student's ID number or say to write a letter, a reference letter, and what I get is a data dump, I get an Excel spreadsheet of 500 students at once, is that my leakiness? Or is that the system dumping data on me? Open data onto my laptop that I don't want on my laptop. 
So, you know, so where does the responsibility lie? Let's turn this around. Um, how many people are really, is anybody in this tune a certified records manager? Do you have any in your labs? Okay. Faculty are not going to be certified records management. Uh, how many of you know what the regular records retention cycle is? One person. Seven years. Seven years, Seven years is, is, the, is the usual, but there's a lot of things where, you know, again, this is another area of professional practice which is not very quickly coming into the data world. Many kinds of records are, are legally supposed to be purged every seven years, but if you don't purge them and you keep them, they are then uh, available for legal discovery. So just because you were supposed to purge it, but if you kept it, then it, could, it becomes discoverable. So stewardship cuts in different ways. Some kinds of data being responsible means keeping them indefinitely. Other kinds of data means purging them on a regular basis. So many, many judgment calls here. So just to kind of wrap this up uh, of the, the challenge that we're facing, is you know, we want to be promoting responsible data practices. You know, build this into, into the way we educate students, educate faculty, educate staff, rethinking a lot of job descriptions, rethinking responsibility, recognizing the very distributed nature of responsibility for data around campuses. Because there's a lot of opportunities, but a lot of risks here as well of the, the community. So open data, we want to release and reuse them and think about the collection, the collaborations, and the publications. So leave plenty of time for questions. Let me uh, end with this set of sort of big takeaway points, which I hope I've made in the last half hour or so. And these are all explored in great depth in a, in a very long and detailed uh, law journal article with many, many footnotes to it which will let you dive even deeper. So these, so these are the ones, is you know, the data are assets to the university, and other people are seeing value in them as well. The University of California has been uh, approached by large Silicon Valley companies who would like to make a deal with us for access to all of the patient records from all five of our medical campuses. Okay. This is a very difficult conversation. People have different ideas of how you should manage this. Okay. And that happens on a big scale, happens on a little scale every day. Think about privacy in context. When is it information privacy? When is it autonomy privacy? Uh, and again, the stewardship in context, sometimes good stewardship means keeping things indefinitely. Other times it means purging them on a cycle. A lot of professional judgment there. Open data, we would like to be able to reuse them for new knowledge, but they expose us to risks as well. Uh, the security, the bigger the data pile, the bigger the targets. The aggregation gives us more power, but it creates even more privacy challenges. And then lastly is the data provenance, or the data, data governance, I'll have provenance issues in here too, is you know, we, we need to move away from ownership which, and move toward, move toward governance issues. And that's really what we've been trying to do in UC, and you'll see uh, much more uh, the word governance around from, you know, principles and processes, and how do we how do we govern these? Okay, so lots of people involved, and let's leave some time for questions. Liz, did you want to handle questions? Sure, that sounds good. Um, we have two. First of all, thank you. <laughs> we have two runners with Mike. Phones. Um, I know we can hear each other pretty well across the room, but for the sake of the recording, if you could wait until somebody gets to you with a microphone before you ask your question. And if possible, if you could try to state your question as a question um, instead of uh, a point, that would be great. Um, Who would like to go first? Fran? Excuse me? Right here. Other side. There you go. Hi. Fantastic talk, Chris. Um, so I have two questions. Um, so let's look at it, you know, from something, uh, quote, manageable, unquote, uh, which is the university itself, administration, faculty, staff, students. Um, number one, what do you think the biggest priorities are for universities to attack? And number two, the, the practical question, you know, if we all want to go do something about this tomorrow, what's the low-hanging fruit and, and what would you recommend? Okay. 
Uh, I think the priorities are, first off, recognizing that a problem exists, which is news to a lot of people. Uh, thinking in terms of governance rather than ownership and who should be responsible. Uh, priorities should be looking for balancing tests to maintain the open by design because we, you know, if we turn this into a military environment where you lock everything down, you'll never be able to share data with your collaborators, your students, or anybody else. So you've got to find that balance. You know, universities do have to be secure difficult as that, though, that sometimes is, but they also have to be open. So working on those balancing tests, I think those are things I'd call for priorities. And the tomorrow thing? The low-hanging fruit is to start the governance conversation and to get these discussions into, you know, the first, do the first dorm talks for the freshmen get them into the first introductions for the graduate students. I think if we start, if we can get people to think about their data as assets that need to be, that, that they can mine, that they can exploit, but in doing so, they need to take responsibility for them also. Okay. So I think that would be the low hanging fruit to start with is to get people educated, think about that trade off as assets, because they'll protect them better if they think they've actually got something valuable. I wonder if I can follow on from that question for just a minute. Um, the University of California system is arguably one of the only institutions more decentralized than Harvard. <laughs> um, how did you think about implementation across a decentralized system like that, and what were the, what were the sort of points of entry at each of the campuses? Vice provost for research, man data management folks? Uh, what we did say, I, mean, I can speak specifically to the UC-wide Privacy Information Security Initiative. Uh, we had several. One is, first we, well, and we also, also co-chaired that Data Governance Task Force. We did, had some other recommendations with that. Uh, there we asked for a, some kind of a, we have a Privacy and Data Protection Board at UCLA that we founded in about, 2004 or 5. So we were very early in thinking about these things. And it turned out to be a very useful process as, as a sounding board and building institutional memory. Because people would come up with a problem and you would have a panel of faculty and staff say, oh, we've seen this before. And these are some of the things to think about. Because people walking in, they don't know the starting point of the OECD principles, notice and consent, and, and so on and so forth, is educating them about that from the beginning. Uh, and we asked for some, some equivalent to be established on all 10 campuses. We asked for somebody to be a privacy officer on each of the 10 campuses. And, in that pro and it didn't have to be a new position created. You just had to assign responsibility for it. And then we tried to find ways to coordinate that conversation around the 10 campuses. And all of those were accepted by Mark Udoff, who was then president of UC. And then it was delivered again to Janet Napolitano and endorsed. And then we endorsed it through the Senate. And it's been adopted on up and down. So, and we, all, we tried to write those documents, both the PISI report and the data governance report, in ways that they could be adopted by other universities. We tried not to make them too UC specific. They're yours. Okay. Thank you. Alyssa needs a microphone. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, I have a question about the library comment you made about that, that it's purposely not um, personalized to you and that they're not mm -hmm. tracking you. I'm sure many of us in this room use search tools outside of the library for things that wind yes. up being scholarly research. Right. And it's amazing what can get recommended to you, even especially on YouTube for some bizarre right. reason. But, but anyway, mm -hmm. so, so you're losing something right. by not doing that. So, so are there libraries that, that let you do an opt-in thing rather than going searching Amazon and then going back to the library catalog? Yes. So, so the, the question is, uh, so, un so li university libraries have had you know, been concerned about exactly this for a long time. They didn't, you know, have, libraries have never wanted to default to tracking, but the opt the opt in uh, works up to a degree, and you see as experiment with some of the opt in to do the recommendations. The difficulty is the scaling problem. If you know, if only five percent of the people opt in, there's not enough sort of basis there to do a real a real recommender system. Uh, but there's there's it's a, it's a constant balance and trade-off because you, libraries are afraid that everybody's going to Google search, Google first, and then Google is the way back in 
to the library systems. So it's being tracked anyway, so should, right, so it's already being tracked, yes, you're exactly right. So should the university do the tracking and then protect the track? I didn't want to say that, that's what I mean. Okay, it, it's a hard conversation as, as Peter well knows, yes, okay. Uh, okay, go ahead and then Prima, yeah, please. Um, in discussing autonomy, uh, so, uh, what is it? Uh, Privacy, sure, sure. <laughs> autonomy, privacy. You talked about class discussions, and as you know, that there are a lot of online courses these days, and some online courses incorporate uh, third-party discussion sites mm -hmm. like Slack. Um, and if you use uh, tools like Slack, the discussions are archived on mm -hmm. Slack, as well as instructors uh, being able to download the data. So I wonder whether there are any recent discussions about um, class discussions online. Yes, that, uh, that came up early on in these systems, uh, and actually one that preceded Slack, uh, we were calling it the Piazza problem for a while, which is we've got shadow networks are appearing where faculty will find a tool that they like, and they like it better than what's on you know, Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle or what, you know, whatever it is that, that's local to it and it's free, and they, they will use it and require their students to use it, and there's no contract with the university. Okay. And then what happens is the free is that the company gets the data, and in, in that case, they're marketing it to potential employers. And students, by enrolling in the course, their choice is either stay in the course and give their data to this company, or not enroll in the course. So that's where the shadow comes in. So, universities, so the universities are trying to get some of these other companies to come to the table to make a university-wide contract that says, yes, we'll work with you, but we get to keep the data and protect it. Okay. And we've got, so, you know, again, we've got, uh, right now, UC is building that into the purchasing agreement of, what, of where the data protection rules are. So you, you've, there's different ways around uh, to embed it. So the Slack channel is a great example of, oh, really great, cool, real-world tool, and yet Slack then has all of those data. Uh, Canvas, you know, similarly making contracts of, you know, can you protect them within that, or are they going to run the analytics and sell them back to you later? You know, whose, whose server does this sit on? So again, it's, what, part of what we're trying to do is just promote awareness. None of this stuff is free. You're paying for it with data. And then how do you get the data back and use it as assets for the university? Prima was here, yeah. And then Charlie, yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a question about uh, the ownership of data or like the claim of actually being able to control those assets. Um, and so in Europe, for instance, we do have this uh, sui generis right on, on databases. And uh, the argument goes that because we do have this uh, this, uh, this two generous right, then people can actually disclose the data because they know that no one can actually um, extensively and substantially reuse it or reproduce it, and therefore there is actually more disclosure. Uh, on the flip side of that, because we do have this sui generis right, then even if the data is actually open and available, then nobody actually knows to which extent they can actually reuse it or right. not, because it's actually very hard to determine whether or not the sui generis right exists. And so, if there is not an actual open data license, then no one will actually be, well, no one actually dare to reuse this data. So, yeah, I just wanted to, yeah. to, to know, like, w how do you actually see this, uh, this sui generis right as actually helping or as actually hindering the, um, the scientific community? Uh, the database rights have been well studied in terms of what they cover for openness. And there's a, uh, there was a study of, that I reported either in this book, I think it was the previous book, Scholarship the Digital Age, about, about 10 years ago, uh, looking at whether it really promoted openness. And at least at that point, it was at not promoting openness. But what you raise is a much bigger problem, which is around licensing. And it's very, it's very hard to know who owns any one of these da data sets. When you start merging them and uh, converging licenses, it gets even harder to track the provenance of who's able to use any of them. So the, the data, the, uh, the European uh, 
data rights around the database law uh, creates one set of problems, but it's a, a, a simple case of a much larger set of licensing ownership and control and what happens when you start to merge them. So if you really want to reuse data, you want to bring them together from multiple places, every one of which has a different set of rules associated with it. It's messy. Shall we? And, and I avoided GDPR, which we can also talk about, but that's another can of worms. Okay. So speaking of messy, that um, the I want to just sort of ask a general question about what are the systematic thinkings behind the dealing with sort of this conflict uh, in terms of goals. Well, one is open access, you know, trying to be as open as possible, mm -hmm. uh, which you want to be transparent and everything, but the other is mm -hmm. to, pri to, to protect the privacy. Mm -hmm. I want to give a specific example where I knew someone, um, someone actually, uh, after he told me this, I never talked to him again, because uh, <laughs> seriously, um, because this is someone, this is a researcher, well, well-respected researcher that told me that he would never, in the, his article, he tried to not write down, uh, trying to write as little detail as possible. Uh, for example, don't tell which version of the data I'm using. So if somebody challenged me, he said, I can say, well, you know, the answer is different because I use a different version. Okay, so I mean, clearly it was you know unethical behavior, nice. and okay. and uh, um, and also you know he would he would try to write a soft model instead of hard model in a sense just verbally say I use the linear model without telling you exactly what it does. That's what protect himself. Um, I think it, he started by protecting himself because of he feels like it's just too much work to answer this. But I think now it become a habit, which I think is really terrible. But now, when those things happens, like, um, you know, they all hide behind the privacy, those things. What are the systematic thinkings like in doing all these policies that, that trying to at least put some safeguard to against, you know, that kind of ab abuse of the privacy pr protection? That's chapter eight of this book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> which is dealing with you know, how much of the how much of the question is uh, is sharing and reuse versus getting credit for things and exposing yourself? Any you know, we're back to the question of signal and noise and what are really data in the first place. You can meet the letter of the law without the spirit of the law very very easily. Plenty of people have told us, sure you can have my data because I know you won't be able to do anything with it. Okay. <coughs> You know, a, a, data, a data dump is a data dump. Okay, it's you know, garbage in, garbage out, needle in the haystack, you, you name it. Uh, just because it's open does not mean that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, or reusable. And different fields have dealt with this in different ways. So astronomy, which we spent a lot of time with Alyssa and, and, and company, it's also why I'm spending so much time here at uh, the Center for Astrophysics, is one where you, the data from the telescope are expected to be open after some, you know, some embargo period, and then you run a pipe. The, the telescope may run a pipeline of processing to reduce and clean those data, but some people will take those data at the end of the official pipeline and use them, and then you can sort of know what happened. But lots of people will take a more raw version and reprocess it in multiple pipelines and then they won't publish, and generally not expected to publish, the pipeline processing per se. And that, of course, is gonna change versions very, very quickly. It's gonna call lots of other things. That, that change is almost impossible. They're using things like Jupyter Notebooks and stuff to kind of get some of the trails out of it. Uh, but what part of this massive thing of whatever, you, you know, drawing a, a circle around what are data and what are not data, what's ex what needs to be released and what are not released, is nigh unto impossible, lots of judgment calls, and the, you know, how we do it varies very idiosyncratically. You know, we'll interview you about your data practice and, say, you know, and you might say everybody does it this way and we go next door, we get a completely different story that ends with everybody does it this way. Because they don't really talk to each other that much. They have very localized ways of handling the data. So this is why the, you know, the FAIR principles are really kind of a holy grail but implementing those in a, in a truly long-term <laughs> reusable way is, is something else. Merce. Well, I, was past this. I always have questions, but I don't know if anybody else has. Okay. 
Yeah, we're we're <laughs> staying just, in the middle here. It'd be nice to get to the back. I'm happy to ask, to ask yeah. questions. Okay. I just thought <laughs> I was just holding the microphone. So, uh, in following up on this, what do you think about the pre registration? I mean, wh one of the answers I was going to give you is that maybe journals or publishers should should also take some responsibility on that, that if somebody publishes something that where the methods are not well defined and, and the data and the code are not available, uh, they do have a responsibility for publishing this too. And that at least for within some fields, this has been addressed this way, right? The, the journals themselves, the data policy and the journals require for more more mm -hmm. uh, explicitly, sometimes yeah. even reproducibility. Yeah. But the other part is that it, well, I was one, wondering what do you think about the pre-registration. Pre yes. How many people know about this whole idea of pre-registering your hypotheses? Okay, uh, uh, just a, a small number of you. Okay, so if you're in the, this is what comes up in the biological sciences, somewhat in the social sciences, social, psych, social psychology is the one that is really having this, the, the, the trolling and the, the battles in social psychology are just amazing right now. You could write soap operas around some of this stuff of, of what's going on. So the idea is the way to avoid cherry picking, how many people know what p-hacking is? Okay. So that's another one, is, you know, trying, you know, is cherry picking the data so that you get something that has a statistically significant finding and then you publish that. So you've got a you know, big set of data, you find what's relevant, you get, you, and then you start to what we call salami slice the, the data and do lots of little papers out of it. So the, the supposed way around this is to publicly register a hypothesis before you do the data collection. And then you can say later, you know, did I do or not? Um, to me, that sounds like sort of Robert Merton and a very, very formalized notion of data as something as, a, as research as something as a cookbook, as opposed to something where there's a lot, you know, there's all kinds of dead ends and paths and explorations. And so we're leading to, Alyssa's got this phenomenal, the, the undiscovered is, you know, what is it when you are looking for one thing and you trip over something completely different? We, you know, the completely different amazing things like the expanding universe when you thought it was a contracting universe, if registering the hypothesis would have taken us way in the wrong direction. So I think it, it forces a formalization on something that is heavily exploratory, but that's also the difficulty of documenting data well enough to reuse it because it's all these tiny little details that don't get written down. You know, the methods section for nature and science give you, you know, about this much space to put the methods detail in, and there's no reward. You know, it's like Charlie's question, too. There's no reward for giving the massive detail so that somebody else might be able to exploit your data for things you didn't see. There's a real mismatch of incentives and rewards here. And that's, that's, again, and that's a lot of what that whole chapter eight was, is about, if you want to read that. Okay. Yeah, back of the room, anybody? Julian, see how well I train my students here. I have no Back here, okay. I'm not a scientist, but I was over at MGH and they were discussing a clinical uh, survey of patients in the field to gather biological data in the genome for their mm -hmm. DNA. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's a dissuasion for people when they're canvassing them to become you know, subjects, prospects as subjects, is that uh, they want to know where this data goes and how secure it is mm -hmm. and which third parties are going to share it. That's not only research, mm -hmm. but private firms, government, and other agencies. Mm -hmm. Right. So then, that, can you I mean, give that, me any reassurance on that? <laughs> right. Okay. That's a that's a huge uh, that's a huge governance problem, and you know certainly clinical trials. It's you know UC and Harvard and everybody else are are wrestling with this. So on the one hand, do you get a permit? You know, a consent form for you know for this study and this study only which means that you can never go back and re and so if you want if you see something interesting later or something might be beneficial to that patient later you, yeah you, you may not be able to go back to it so the the alternative is then that like this completely open consent which patients are often reluctant to do then you've got a a, a direction being pushed by uh, sagebound networks and john wilbanks of 
thinking, in particular for things like orphan diseases, where there's small patient groups that really want their data to be used in new ways, and they're very happy to get it out there, because you know, it might be just a handful of people, and they're trying to push a different kind of consent form. So again, it's really contextual about just how much you want to do, because going back and finding patients again and reconsenting them, as they say, over the long term is problematic. But there's also you know, layers of uh, you know, degrees of accessibility and data enclaves of how much access you get. There's, there's different ways of protecting these data, too. Is that reassuring at all? Uh, to some degree, yeah. OK, it's good. Some right. of the universities are sort of in a position where they can make up a lot of their own governance. It's kind of a patchwork that there's no uniform broad statute covering all of it. Well, there's like not, in the EU or other places. Well, there's there's broad statutes around uh, around human subjects, and it comes out of Health and Human Services, right. and then okay. and then that comes down to to all the universities. But there's not a lot of coordination of of the IRBs, the Institutional Review Boards, on individual campuses, and those are made up of people who generally are methodological experts. They're not necessarily data science experts, and they're certainly not security experts for the most part. Yeah. So you, you, know, you can take the same study to three different IRBs and, and get very different answers about what is appropriate use and, and protection and so on. I think it's probably more consistent in medicine than maybe in social sciences, which is what I'm more familiar with. Okay. Um, and there's a the question here at, at the back, too. Mm -hmm. and I think there's one over here. So I was Okay, oh. um, I, I was curious about, obviously there's been a lot of work in the computer science field on algorithms for providing a particular type of privacy, so providing what's called differential Differential privacy, privacy right, right, yeah. And, and for a particular type of data release from a database, that, then I think we understand that quite well. And what I'm wondering is, is if you think about the theory and the algorithmic work, and if you think about the practice and the deployment of these systems, how, how much work do we still need to do on that particular narrow question to get the systems that, you know, to even have this be really part of the conversation that mm -hmm. universities are having or should be having such that we can have these, these techniques really be kind of leveraged and help to, and mm -hmm. help to begin to answer parts of these questions. Yeah. Only, you know, narrow slices, but right. I'm just wondering how far from that are we at the moment? Right. Uh, Cynthia Dwork gave an excellent presentation last week on, on the differential privacy. And you know, her context is more around you know, really big data, you know, the, the Facebook, the Amazon kind of data, uh, and how, or, or, or you know, big patient records and, and how you filter out of that. So you know, certainly we need to move that scientifically forward. But let's turn around and think about a, a case on this campus. So somebody does a study of campus climate. You know, how do you feel about you know, diversity and how you're being treated and so on and so forth. These are very sensitive topics. And if they're done for internal management purposes, the IRBs don't touch them. They say these are not IRB issues if it's not going to get published. And then somebody comes back a year later and says, we've got some really cool data here. We want to publish these. This happens all the time. Something was a cert, it was an internal survey, not subject to IRB. Then IRB comes back and says, okay, you can reuse them in this way. But by that point, highly sensitive data had been collected that probably shouldn't have been collected in the first place. And then you're trying to republish and filter them later. We're not talking on a scale, and we're not talking about a you know, kind of use that you could probably put these algorithms on. Okay. So this is where a whole lot of, I think, is much more uh, subject to you know, governance and people thinking sensitively about what issues are at stake and whose privacy is at stake than thinking about purely technological solutions. If we're talking about things like what's around the edge of the network, so when UCLA was, uh, had a breach at a level that had to be reported a couple of years ago from the medical center, we don't even know if they actually breached anything, but it, it, you know, it got to the legal point of, of reporting. The, the first move by the president of UC was to put monitoring equipment on the edges of all 10 campuses and then hide that monitoring uh, equipment under legal privilege and not tell the faculty. 
So the Berkeley faculty went to the New York Times pretty quickly when they found out. Okay, again, this is not how you want to do governance. But you know that the firestorm that resulted led to some very good and important conversations of getting people to think about those things. And among the questions are, you know, what is you know what is happening? What's being collected? How how long is it being held? Who has access to it? So questions of you know are there data there that the Chinese students are you know worried about is ever going to get back to their governance, their governments. You know, is there stuff from classrooms? Is there stuff from my research? You know, what's being tracked around there? And you see put in uh, such protections for the, the big contract, which is now FireEye, that it looks a lot more like GDPR. It looks a lot more, I mean, it's, it's not, not as close as some of us would like it to be. But it's, they said what they had to do for UC, they're again using to work with Europe because the European protections are, are, are much stronger. So again, it's asking the question, the fact that the faculty got very strongly engaged about asking these questions that, you know, some of those things you can run algorithms on, there's plenty of algorithms being run there, but it is the more up close and personal that the, the real challenges are. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, there's a gentleman back here who's been waiting, I think. Okay. And then Alyssa, if there's time. Okay. Uh, hi. I'm currently doing research on a uh, on issues of data on issues of data ownership and such as related to connected vehicles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of wondering how much of the push in academia is towards the desire for good practices and how much is backed by the law. I'm just trying to figure out I mean I see some overlap and I'll be uh, looking into it, but I'm just wondering where where the push is coming from here. Where, the pu where, where which push is coming from? For better data protection practices, better data governance, et cetera. I've been trying to look up uh, what laws might apply to the situation, especially in regards to terms of use, terms and conditions. Apologies, sure, yeah. this is a little outside the scope of the talk. Yeah. The you know certainly the push inside you know with with our experience is coming fr is coming from a lot from the faculty, mm -hmm. but also from. The, the privacy officer, and we have a, um, a legal counsel. So Kent Wada is our uh, privacy officer, has been for a long time, and Amy Blum, the C campus counsel, who have been very privacy focused. So we have worked extremely closely with them, where a lot of campus councils are much more kind of you know, protecting the university from lawsuits and not trying to deal directly with faculty and students and think about how we you know, keep this a safe space within the campus. So I see in our, our case, it's, it's faculty and faculty and student and administrative driven. Uh, but this is, a lot of this is Wild West. I and mean, when we started realizing that we're collecting all kinds of data that really are usable under FERPA and uh, they, they don't fall under these areas of governance and said, how are we going to, what are the principles, what are the practices, who's going to do this? And we need to do it in a lightweight way because it's, the IRBs are a very heavyweight solution. This takes loads of time, lots of administrative overhead. They have to meet every week. Um, we, don't, we can't have something that heavy handed. Nobody's willing to do that. So what are lighter weight solutions? And that, that's, there's no simple answer, but we're looking for lighter weight solutions that we can get this, get this governance. And I don't have easy answers for where the laws are, but the fact that there aren't a lot of laws is what's making people feel like they've got the way to do these modeling. And we've got universities, again, it's, uh, it's in this, this Berkeley paper who are saying, oh, let's just label the students red light, green light, yellow light, and tell them whether they should stay in this major or not, and let's compare their Facebook feed to their ID card that says, what, you know, are they doing their homework at two o'clock in the morning or two in the afternoon? Uh, what, are they eating pizza or are they eating vegan food? You know, how are they moving around campus? How can we model these students' behavior, which I find absolutely terrifying, uh, but there's a lot of universities are doing this, okay? So this is, I think that if enough, enough of these scary scenarios hit the front pages, more people pay attention. But let's, let's, try to prevent, let's try to prevent those. And I think that's kind of a good wrap up is, you know, let's be good stewards of the data that we're collecting. Let's treat them as assets and responsibilities. Because the public trust for universities I think really is at stake. As um, Larry Backhouse said on Friday, it's the, you know, trust is at stake. And we, you know, we need to invest in the universities in, in very responsible ways that we continue to embody that trust. I think this is an area that we can do that and we should be doing that. So. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.